So I'm just going to go down the line as far as um, calling on speakers. And Ernesto, you lucky devil. You're <laughs> closest to me. Um, Ernesto, why don't you speak um, on the electronic frontier and tell us what they do and how you see this current administration affecting sure, the sure. area. Uh, and, and before I even leave to know that, the mentioning of Howard Dean brought a smile to my, my face. I, uh, the, day, the night after I graduated college, I flew out, I went down to Cal Plus, yes, Bisbo. The night, the night after I graduated college, I flew out to Manchester to work for Dean for New Hampshire. Uh, I am part of the, the, the Dean the Dean crowd, so I um, worked as primary campaign for, <coughs> for months in the winter. And uh, it's great to see that folks are still active, that he's still kind of, the whole reason I care about, you know, got involved in politics was, was him and, and here I am today. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation, what, what we are is uh, primarily we're a public interest law firm, uh, meaning we represent people at no cost to them, uh, primarily on issues of civil liberties, uh, free speech, your right to privacy in terms of your Fourth Amendment rights, uh, as well as uh, issues that impact uh, the right to share information and disseminate information. So this is uh, copyrights, patents, and trademarks. Uh, we also are very active uh, in Washington, D.C. now. That's my primary job. I, I go to D.C. to represent the membership of BFF on issues like uh, network neutrality uh, and privacy law, surveillance, and a number of other issues that the United States Congress deals with you know, on, a, on an annual basis. Um, we, as I mentioned, we're a membership-driven organization, so we, uh, we regularly reach out to our, you know, our, our, our members to try and educate them on what's happening in the courts. Uh, as well as what's happening day to day in Congress. And you know, that's why I like coming out to events like this, because I, I try to be as useful as a resource to anyone here, uh, kind of about what's happening in Washington, D.C. Because um, I go out there probably every two or three months, uh, and I used to work there for about nine years prior. Um, that's actually where I ended up after doing the end of all that. So the two issues I'll talk about is uh, privacy, and kind of I'll, I'll, I'll talk about kind of the two types of privacy that exist. There's, you know, privacy from the commercial entities, namely your internet service providers uh, and other private actors, and privacy in terms of your right to be free from uh, surveillance from your government. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about the open internet order, net neutrality, kind of what's, what's the fight ahead coming in the next few months, probably the next few couple years, if not longer, uh, that, that we'll be facing in, in DC. So, you know, the, the primary legislative body where all of this is going to be fought out is the United States Senate. And the, and, and that's, the reason that is is because any, any sort of consequential bill or, or anything that determines funding, which you know, today is the day the President released his budget, uh, the United States Congress has to pass a spending bill by April 28th or else the government runs out of money and then you have to shut down uh, issue. But you would need eight Democratic senators to agree with the Republican Party on anything they want, which in the United States Senate. In the House, it's much more of a one-sided situation where a simple majority is all you need to be able to move the process forward. And as and everyone knows, uh, the, the Republican Party is a strong majority, and they tend to stick together on, on most things. I think uh, the healthcare debate is the first time in a long time I've seen them being very divided because you know now it's them you know, they're at a point where the rhetoric has to be thrown and they actually have to demonstrate what do they mean, right? Like, what do they mean by uh, changing healthcare and, and who, who are the winners and losers? Because there's always, uh, there's always going to be winners and losers what they've described to people and now they have to, have to show their work. And I think that's a lot more challenging than being on the minority side being, uh, you know, criticized. Um, in terms of uh, privacy from, uh, from the private market, there is a bill right now that Senator Flake from Arizona as introduced uh, that would roll back the recent uh, expansion of consumer privacy protections that the Federal Communications Commission issued at the end of last year. Uh, they're using a process, and, and folks may be familiar with this process, called the Congressional Review Act, which is a, a procedure that bypasses the Senate filibusters, which is what makes it kind of dangerous, uh, and, and can roll back any regulation that was, was instituted towards the end of the last administration. So almost every, in, Regulation that's been rolled back in the last four weeks have all gone have all gone through this process, right? They don't need a single Democratic senator to vote with them in order to get it through, and it applies to anything within the last five or right, sixty days of the last term. Um, so, 
the dangerous part about what's called this congressional review act CRA, is how I refer to it short, is it puts a preclusion on an agency from enacting rules that are substantially similar in form. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the legal consequences of that type of repeal? No one knows the answer to that right now. And the, you know, I'm an attorney as well, and, and, and my, my analysis is uh, it could be fairly damaging to the ability of, of federal agencies to, to come back later and, and um, you know, institute their role as, as protecting consumers. Uh, substantially similar form in the sense that the SEC later on, if they repeal it, if they repeal the privacy protections that exist over your uh, usage of, uh, of internet, um, a future SEC may not be able to come back and say, here, you know, reinstitute those protections in response, um, or institute privacy protections that are that are not verbatim identical but but similar. And the real fear and challenge is because Congress is so difficult to pass anything. Right now, right? It's just the gridlock is just, is just substantial. If they if they get this done, you may have a situation where there's no federal agency that can tell Comcast, Verizon, AT and T, and all these like major tele telephone and cable companies uh, what they can do with your personal data. Uh, that that is a huge step back from where we've been for the last give or take 20 years of law. Um, and you know we're we're doing our best to you know our job really is to convince three Republican senators. Just like any other, you know, any other time you're talking about a simple majority <coughs> in the Senate, um, to that this this carries electoral consequence, right? The no one likes their cable company, no one likes their telephone company, and no one feels comfortable with the idea that they can see what your browsing history is and then repackage that and sell it to the next highest bidder. Um, there is this danger about DC, and I will say, having lived there for a long time, uh, and now living outside of there for a long time, that. People get sucked into this, you know, inner bubble dialogue of, oh, like, you know, people would prefer like a more, you know, different type of regulation or uh, more efficient use of government research or, or just whatever they want to tell themselves, which is usually perpetuated by kind of industry lobbyists who, you know, kind of spin a very nice tale. Um, because when you get out of that city, you know, you ask people uh, what do they think about their ISP, they they all have a very negative opinion. Um, that's because a lot of us don't have a lot of choice. Right. In DC, you have a lot of choice. There's actually neighborhoods that have three providers. You have Verizon Fios, you have uh, Comcast, and you have an overbuilder on top of Comcast. So when you're in that city and you live in a wealthy neighborhood, you have this idea of like, oh, like, competition's up great. Everyone's got a lot of choice. Uh, any place I've lived outside of the city, my choice has always been Comcast. Um, so you know, my suggestion, my ask, my ask for everyone's help, uh, you know, kind of the, the tough thing about California is that our senators are going to be in the right place. Right, and, and consistently in the right place on a lot of these issues. Um, you know, we need to make, you have, you have friends in, say, Colorado, Nevada, Ohio, like states that have, particularly where they're better split between a Democratic senator and a Republican senator, you know there's a very healthy uh, split crowd that, that doesn't just lean hard to one side of the ideological table. And at the end of the day, we need three three Republicans to say, I don't feel comfortable voting for something that is a pure party line vote. Right? They can only take so many of these votes before they themselves uh, will be looking to the abyss when it's their turn for a re-election. So that's the issue on, that's kind of one of the issues right now on the privacy front. Um, go to, I forgot to even mention our website, uh, EFF.org. Uh, we regularly detail kind of the status of this fight. Um, I'm, I'm on conference calls with a lot of folks that are fighting this fight. And, and we have a campaign that's trying to get a lot of people to, to you know, make those phone calls and send those letters uh, to their to their elected members. That those are essential. I mean, uh, having worked in, I worked in Congress for six years. I, I will tell you, not enough people talk to their elected official. And it was gratifying to see in the last couple of weeks, in the last month even, people are going to these town halls in, in numbers I've never seen before. Um, it scares the hell out of an elected. Like, they, they will talk a big game, like, oh, it's paid protesters, who cares? No way. Like, they know very few people go to these things, and all of a sudden they're seeing hundreds of people show up. They're suddenly worried, these are my constituents who have neighbors, who have friends. Um, so keep doing that. And then I, I will just speak briefly on, on, the, gov on the privacy side on, on government. Uh, at the end of this year, the government reauthorizes one of its major surveillance programs. This is Section 702 of the FISA Act. Uh, we have a senator that sits on the Intelligence Committee, uh, brand new senator, Senator Kamala Harris. Uh, we actually have a you know, very direct role as Californians to have uh, a direct say in the, the direction of the, intelligence, you know, the surveillance laws go because she has, you know, she's first in line on the Committee of Jurisdiction itself. 
Uh, and then just to wrap up on network neutrality, the FCC chairman, his name is Chairman Ajit Pai, uh, has a very negative impression of the open internet order, has a very negative impression about network neutrality. We'll talk a big game about internet freedom, but uh, we await to see what his first actions are in this, and we are ready to activate and get the, you know, get, we, we gotta get a lot of people to, to, to speak to the FCC and also contact our members of Congress about why it's important to maintain their, the rules that ensure that you know, no one can control your internet experience, whether it's the cable company, telephone company, or, or, or the government. Um, because there's this, there's a little bit too much faith that Verizon needs to take off. have your best intentions in mind. So, that I'll go ahead and answer from the after. Okay. Any questions now? Let's do the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll do questions afterwards. Okay. And um, Raphael Trujillo. Okay. Speaking of criminal justice. <laughs> criminal justice. Okay, so what I was told about what to expect of the, the new administration and, and how it's going to affect us locally. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing for 35 years in San Francisco. Uh, former public defender here in San Francisco for 25 of my years. I'm in private practice now. Um, so the, this is the, we're in the Northern District of, Cal, uh, of California, and the Attorney General for this location is uh, this man by the name of Brian Stretch. He, he succeeded Melinda Haig, who was the original appointee by um, President Obama. Uh, as you know, the other day, the uh, president uh, terminated uh, all the uh, local uh, uh, responsible attorney generals, and, and there's going to be a new appointment. So the question is, who's coming? And, um, <clears throat> and so we can predict what's going to come. It's going to become basically uh, the same person that we had before. And it's uh, Mr. Rusinello. Joe Rusinello has been uh, basically is in the running. I don't know if he will be actually appointed. Uh, he's he's going to be his third term probably as being the U.S. Attorney for this district. He's always been he's under Reagan. He was under Bush, and now he's uh, probably he, he's very interested in, in, in serving again. Uh, he's a very conservative person, uh, and uh, it's going to be fine to, to go forward with the conservative policies of Mr. Sessions. But what are we left with? I mean, I, I just, uh, Mr. Obama actually wrote a, Harvard, uh, a, a, a commentary in the Harvard Law Review, what he used to uh, edit uh, as a student there in law school, and it was just published last month in a Harvard Law Review, and it was kind of in, in, so I read through that, and then I read through the criticism about what happened there. And, you know, it was an old rule, it was an old term in, uh, in criminal law, basically, um, as much as things change, things, things don't change, and I don't think things are going to change much here. Uh, because, I mean, there are certain things that Mr. Obama did do that were very unique, that no other president did, and he tried to do, but one of them was that he did go to a prison itself. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but he did actually make that visit. That's a huge thing, and he went down to, to see how the, uh, the conditions are that people have to exist in, and the supermaxes of which are plenty throughout, spread out throughout the nation. Uh, he did institute a clemency project, uh, and you know he did that in 1920. <laughs> And he tried to uh, was roll that with great fanfare about the idea that they were going to try to reduce the prison population and try to address the issue that had to deal with the draconian sentencing mandatory minimums that were put in place under Reagan in 1986 that we still live with uh, in the federal system. Uh, initially, um, the Attorney General, it, I, his idea was that there was going to be about 10,000 people that were going to be affected by this particular new policy change. But there were so many roadblocks put in front of that and um, considerations that were put in front of that in order for somebody to qualify for those uh, clemency type of things. We're not talking pardons. I mean, clemency means that, uh, and he did grant clemencies. He granted about 1,600. But of the 10,000 that were promised through several typical programs, but uh, they, were, they were listed, they came, those clemencies came with conditions. So you had to apply and you had to, get, you had to meet certain conditions. The conditions that were very difficult for the inmate population to meet it in itself. Um, and so from the 10,000 people promised, we had 1,600 delivered in terms of clemency. That means they got reduced sentences. They did not get pardons. Pardons are different. That means that your crime was completely eliminated from your history. Okay, there was about 168 pardons that were granted at the, um, 
in the final months of Mr. Obama's term, and one of them was granted to one of my clients, my wife's clients. A very hard thing to do. Uh, and those are people from, from, from the 80s that were getting their, their cases pardoned. Uh, Mr. Obama always, always, always believed in a strong police state. Uh, that was something that he always talked about. And, um, and on the other hand, he believed in some idea of some type of, uh, I guess we would call it justice with mercy. Um, and, you know, but, so, you know, he did face a very difficult Congress, but we did have a big majority, super majority in the first two years and plus of his, his first term. And a lot of things just didn't happen. He did, so the most of the things that he did, I mean, the most significant legislation that came out of the Obama period, that came out from the Obama term, was the, um, was the Equal uh, Sentencing Initiative, which, which had to deal with, uh, you know, the equalization between powder cocaine terms and crack cocaine terms. And that was the only piece of legislation that happened. It didn't equalize the amount of, uh, of time that people spend for the same amount of quantity, uh, but it did reduce it from less than about 120 times uh, greater to about 18 times greater. It's an improvement, but it's not equal. Uh, people are still going to prison for those things um, and doing some big time. Uh, he did create so the, the rest that was able to happen under the Obama administration was this thing called, the, what they tried to do is implement a, like a federal diversion program. And it's called the Criminal Alternatives Program. And you know, that was something that the government, his own uh, Justice Department signed on to reluctantly. Okay? So it wasn't really fully implemented. Uh, the judges were uh, actually wanted to do this and wanted to participate, but the, the, the way the, the system is set up, the Attorney General has the full discretion as to what charges to bring and eliminate the discretion as to what the judges can have in terms of the mandatory minimum. But the, judge, the judges in the federal systems are, are kind of hand-tied, uh, hands are tied very, very, very strongly uh, under, the, uh, under these policies. So we're well, not under, these, under the legislation the way we currently operate. Um, there was a reduction in federal, in federal prison population. This is true. Uh, but um, the incarceration rate across the United States remains the same. There's about 2.2 million people currently car incarcerated at different levels throughout the United States in federal, state, and private uh, incarceration systems. 25% um, of the uh, black male population in the United States has some type of a felony record. One in 20 black males right now in the United States are actively under probation or parole supervision. Um, so the problem was that it may not have been improved in terms of the level of the federal incarceration rate and because of charging decisions that were made in terms of the policies to how they were going to uh, implement uh, charging uh, on individual cases, the, pra the problem was just transferred directly to the states to how to implement it. And the incarceration rate stays the same. Uh, the federal government didn't pick up the cases. Um, things remain the same as much as they change. One thing Mr. Obama did throughout his term, which was very, very good, was to, talk, was to begin this science working group on, uh, to establish uniform standards for in forensic, uh, forensic uh, evidence type of cases and science. Well, to, to investigate what is true science and what is fake. Uh, and that's something that was a successful project and that is in working. There are uh, they're working groups on different areas, in DNA, on fingerprints, on uh, firearm type of uh, matching between casings and stuff, and eyewitness IDs. There's standards now in there. You know, fingerprints is not a science. Uh, and matching uh, case, casings from, uh, from uh, spent casings on evidence scenes with particular firearms is not a science. Uh, this is huge, because for years people were able to testify to that. Eyewitness ID um, is something that there is something that they took on very hard and, they, and there's some good working groups in that. Uh, but what to expect in the future? I mean, well, they don't believe in it. 
They don't believe in science. So that's, I don't know where that's going to go. Um, you know, the, the asset forfeiture situation, uh, when people are charged with crimes and the asset forfeitures, you know, your assets are taken prior to you being convicted, that is at the highest rate it's ever been exercised by the federal by the federal government under this last administration. What do you think is going to happen? That's going to continue on even greater. Uh, what happened under Obama administration, which we expect to be even further enhanced, I believe, would be the militarization of our local police. That was not only implemented, it was, uh, it was uh, transferred to uh, a lot of uh, local polices. That's only going to be enhanced. I think it's going to be increased because of Mr. Trump's idea that he uh, wants to increase the military budget. And then the last thing is that Mr. Obama did do one thing that the Electronic Frontier Foundation knows. He expanded the surveillance state. And that's something we have to deal with. And that is only something that's only going to get worse. So, well, so, you know, the practice here is to, is for the president to consult the two senators from the states where they need to appoint new attorney generals. Do you think that's going to happen here? I mean, really. There's the Northern District, the Central District, the Southern District, the Southeastern District. Uh, so, California is it's got, is it, it's got six, six, uh, six federal judicial uh, areas for practice. I took a look at the, uh, the website of the, of, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the current uh, uh, United States Attorney's Office. You think they're going to continue on with uh, programs such as uh, a human trafficking summit, a, Bay a, a drug abuse summit, a stop bullying summit? You think they're going to give a shit about, excuse my language, care about your, your fraud, you know, consumer fraud or uh, mortgage scams? That's only going to get worse. Um, I think the best thing you can do is to uh, you know, contact your local senators, make sure that they stand strong and have some type of good uh, input into that process of the selection of the local person. Because one of the big things that's on their agenda is, uh, and which never went away, uh, was, the, uh, was the prosecution of marijuana uh, cultivation and, uh, and uh, distribution in mass. And uh, Melinda Haig took that on with the uh, Oakland Cannabis uh, Center there. And uh, I think it's just going to be re resurrected. We're just going to have another problem. Uh, so from my opinion, what Mr. Obama did, and you should read his article in, in the Harvard Law Review, I mean, uh, he, tries, he did a lot to try from a policy perspective. Uh, but uh, only one piece of significant legislation, which is even, even, even not even this enough to make it equal. Uh, and he was, he was stopped with a bad Congress. And uh, so we need to turn it blue. But even then, you don't even know. Thank you very much, Jeff.